Hello, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a webinar series where we help you turn your brown thumb green. We're so excited today to share information with you about one of my favorite shrubs. And no, it's not magnolias, it's hydrangeas. Today is hydrangea day with lots and lots of information about one of the most beloved shrubs that's out there. We have with us Andrew Bunting from the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, and he'll join us with just a second. But in the meantime, I want to remind you to put your questions in the chat box. I know it'll be a full program. I saw the list of hydrangeas that Andrew's going to share with us, so he needs lots of time, but we'll answer the questions as best as we can for you. Andrew, your, your slideshow just disappeared for some reason. Uh-oh. Uh that's all right. Maybe you need to plug in your computer. No, no, that's okay. Let me, let me reshare. All right, we'll do that. Um, as I said, we're excited to see all these wonderful, wonderful hydrangeas and give you lots of good information. Put your questions in the chat box. At the end, we'll be able to answer the ones we have time for. So, Andrew Bunting take it away i'll join you at the end of your presentation thank you so much for being here with us today and don't forget to put a pitch in for the philadelphia <laughs> flower show yeah wonderful, i will wonderful show all right thank all right. you thanks so. cindy I, it. I assume it's back up again it is back up again okay. thank you all right great thank uh th thank you cindy and sarah and uh other great folks at uh smith smithsonian gardens it's nice to be back and uh talk to you today about hydrangeas and their relatives, which there, there, there are a lot. Uh, I'll try to squeeze uh, a lot of content into uh, about an hour. And then if you have questions, you can put those in the, in the chat. So before we get started, I just wanted to uh, introduce some of you. Uh, if you were on the, my Magnolia talk, you probably saw some of this. It'll be a little redundant. But for those of you who weren't, um, I'm the Vice President of Public Horticulture at Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, which was founded in 1827. So we're almost 200 years old. We're the oldest uh, horticultural society in, in the United States. And uh, most of our programs, uh, like the, the Smithsonian Gardens are outward facing, whether it's our educational programs or all of the public gardens that we maintain, uh, similar to uh, the Smithsonian Gardens, where they're uh, free and open to the public all the time. So just a, a little bit of history about uh, uh, P PHS. Uh, we're really a community-based organization. So in addition to my department, we have a very large uh, uh, community vegetable garden program, a street tree program, uh, we have a very large program called healthy, or sorry, called uh, land care, uh, where we clean and green vacant lots. Uh, over the last 25 years, we've cleaned and greened, and we actually maintain 12,000 vacant lots um, as green spaces throughout the city. We have an audience engagement team that does all our educational programming. And of course, we have the Philadelphia Flower Show, which will... Uh, be starting soon, June 5th to the 13th in FDR Park outside for the first time in 190 years. So the flower show has actually been running since uh, 1828. So uh, just some of our uh, impact priorities um, you, you can see here. Um, so uh, we have four impact priorities. So creating healthy living environments, increasing access to fresh food, building meaningful social connections, and also expanding economic opportunity. A lot of our programming is in Philadelphia, but it's not only in Philadelphia. We serve the, the greater Philadelphia area and in, in many cases beyond as well. Uh, in my area, we have uh, uh, kind of cu currently four subsets. Uh, we have a public garden to the north called Meadowbrook Farm. We have multiple public landscapes. So those would be areas like the Azalea Garden, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Rodin Museum, Logan Square, 
uh, many gardens at the Navy Yard, Delaware River, Waterfront. Uh, in urban activations, we have two pop-up gardens, which are kind of uh, quasi-permanent, where we work with a restaurant tour and we have food and beverage as well. So there's one on South Street and a, a new one in Maniunk. And then we have a division called Ur Urban Design that uh, does helps with our urban activations, but also does uh, some work uh, with parks and recreation. And then just mentioning Meadowbrook Farm, that's our, uh, that's really the only property we truly own. Uh, all these other gardens that we run are done in partnerships with other entities like the Philadelphia Museum of Art or the Navy Yard or uh, whoever the case might be. And then our urban design team, what they do is, uh, uh, currently uh, parks and recreation work, uh, but they, they get involved in other urban activated sites as well. And they do a lot of uh, uh, green stormwater infrastructure uh, projects, and then they've helped us design our two pop-up gardens as well. So getting into the program, I thought, uh, Perhaps a good way to start would be that, you know, all, all of these, whether they're hydrangeas or any other plant, um, while many of them have been selected and hybridized over the years, there's often a species that, the, that is the precursor to all, all of these plants. So really to create any great ornamental group of plants, you need to have good, what's called germplasm to work with, which is genetic material. And this material often comes from, it can come from the garden, but it often comes from plant collecting trips. So I've been on a few. This was actually one I went on with a uh, uh, guy with kind of the quasi bald head is Dan Hinckley. And to his left is Ozzy Johnson. And to his left is Scott McMahon. And we went on, this was on a plant collecting trip to Vietnam. And uh, we collected many, many hydrangeas on that trip trip and many are in cultivation now and many are actually being used for uh, germplasm for selection and breeding purposes as well. So here's one that we're actually collecting. This is probably a, a Velosa type. Uh, there's so many hydrangeas, especially, I mean, there's quite a few native hydrangeas in the US, but there's a lot of hydrangea species all throughout uh, Asia, especially China and then uh, quite a few in, in Vietnam. And we were collecting in Northern Vietnam with the idea that those plants would be in hardy in places like Atlanta, perhaps uh, with a little protection in Washington, DC. So Dan alone, I think has led 14 trips to Vietnam. So we actually, if you look at that mountain range, that's called Five Fingers and if you go kind of in the middle of those mountains, we came up over, over the backside of that and then down through the valley. And we were, you know, in, in, that, in that northern part of Vietnam for about uh, uh, two and a half weeks. And this is kind of just typical collecting, you know, you, you kind of see a plant in the wild. It may only have seed on it. You know, we were collecting in the fall when seed is most prevalent. So you don't even necessarily see what the plant looks like. So, you know, you're doing uh, it's somewhat speculative work, but with the hope that it'll either uh, yield something that's good for an ornamental point of view, but actually more importantly, that you're bringing back plants that then can be grown on in, in different botanic gardens and arboreta, and then you have um, you know, that genetic representation in the collection, which is really important uh, from a plant conservation perspective. So that, there, there we are. I actually don't have the, there was another picture that goes with this. It was, our guide's name is Ook, and it was his birthday. And we said, you know, you can pick whatever you want to have for dinner for your birthday. And what he picked was a deep fried bee larva which of course I've never had before. Uh, there, actually, Ozzy Johnson, he's uh, heavily involved in the uh, American Hydrangea Society. So if you're really interested in society uh, or in hydrangeas, I would recommend the uh, American Hydrangea Society, which is based in Atlanta. And they, they actually do quite a bit of 
uh, great online programming as well. And then Dan Hinckley's in the, in the foreground. This is actually a lily we collected. You know, on any typical collecting trip, you might make, you know, 100 to 250 collections or so. So, you know, we're also collecting data like uh, GPS coordinates and any uh, anecdotal information uh, that we can add to the records. And that just kind of deepens the, uh, the provenance of these collections. So just that, that being said, uh, that type of work is always important and it, and it is ongoing by uh, different collecting groups around the world. So my first group is uh, uh, hydrangea serrata and some serrata hybrids. So uh, the one, one hydrangea I don't have a lot on today because you can give a whole presentation on it are your typical mop heads and lace caps, the hydrangea macrophyllas. I felt like that's a group that uh, people know a lot about. So I, I really am focusing on some other hydrangeas that perhaps are less known. So hydrangea preziosa is a, a pink mop head. So a mop head is one of the, the ball type hydrangeas. If it has a flat top, that's called a, a lace cap. So preziosa, it's theorized that it's actually a hybrid between macrophylla and serrata. So the serratas are called the Japanese hydrangea. And uh, they tend to be more diminutive in, in size and stature in leaf, oftentimes in the size of the flower, but they offer a lot more hardiness. So in areas where it gets really cold, like Chicago, uh, hydrangea macrophylla often isn't a real viable species unless it's a species that blooms on, on new wood, which means if it died to the ground and grew up in that season, it would flower on that, that new growth like endless summer. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of cultivars don't bloom on new wood. They need uh, stems that are two years old at least to flower. So some of these mop head and lace cap types are difficult in, the, in say Chicago or, or, or even colder areas or sometimes even in the Philadelphia area. So the serratas are, are much hardier than the macrophyllas. And they really don't uh, ever run the risk of, um, of, of really dying to the ground. So here's Preziosa. This is actually a Chanticleer. And what's interesting about Preziosa is uh, it's for the most part always pink. So these ones that are the, either the mop head or, or the lace cap, uh, the, the general rule is if it's in a fairly acidic soil, say a pH of seven or below, uh, they tend to be blue. If they're more of an alkaline soil, they tend to be kind of a pink or a pinky purple. Uh, but Preziosa seems to stay relatively pink uh, regardless of the, the pH of the soil. It gets about um, six, seven feet tall. I would say hydrangeas in general, this, this type, that while they'll take shade, they prefer uh, more of a dappled shade. And actually with a little bit more sun, they'll flower better, but you don't wanna put them in full blazing sun either. So there's a bunch of um, serrata types that are really, most of them don't get much more than three, four, five feet tall with an equal spread. And then they, they just are more refined and uh, kind of have diminutive aspects to the leaves and flowers. So an older cultivar is one called Bluebird. So on the lace caps, what you have is in the center of the flower, where you see the blue flowers, those are the fertile flowers, the seed producing flowers. And then the showy part of what most people consider the hydrangea flowers is actually a sterile bract, which in the case of light, lace cap kind of radiates around the, the outer tier of the flower. And then with the hortensia or, or mop heads, it's almost all, or at least what you see is almost all the, the sterile florets and while there actually are fertile flowers kind of buried uh, in the flower itself. So this would, again, this would be same rule. If it's acid soil, it's gonna be blue. If it's an alkaline soil, pH over seven, 7.5, it's going to be pink. 
Now, if it's white, like this one, which is, uh, uh, so this one, sorry, was uh, Kirahime. Um, uh, let me get this right. Look, I, I have them out of order. This one is Kirahime. So, um, and this one, it, so on your list, uh, this is Kirahime, and this one is uh, Shirote. So Shirote is a double white, and if it's white, it's white. It doesn't, it doesn't change uh, with the pH. So just to be clear, this is Bluebird, uh, and then Shirote, and then um, uh, Kirahime. So you can see this one is probably the acidity of the soils probably on this one over seven. So it's actually kind of going towards a pinky lilac color versus blue. And then uh, sh Shirote again. So Shirote you often see uh, sometimes sold as like a potted plant in, in the nursery. Sometimes there's one called like uh, Fuji waterfall. That, that's actually very similar uh, to this one. Another double, again, if this was a more acidic soil, it would go, it would go blue. This is Medora Boshi. And then this is a uh, Kiyosumi. Uh, so this is, um, what I like about this one, it's kind of like uh, uh, pinwheels with like uh, uh, a little deeper pink Picati uh, edge. And these are all really nice, small and, and refined little hydrangeas for the garden. So if you have a small you know, say you live in the city and you have a small front yard or backyard, these are a great hydrangea because they really take up a small amount of um, uh, real estate. Uh, one that's actually been around a while is uh, Benigaku. Uh, I, I have this one in my garden. So of all these Japanese cultivars, Benigaku's probably been in the trade the, the longest. And mine gets about uh, five feet tall with a spread of maybe three feet or so. And then uh, Benigaku, actually the flowers can fade to a, a pinkish color. One of my favorites is this one, Miyama Ye Murasaki, uh, even smaller than Benigaku in stature and then has these kind of double uh, sterile florets. This picture I actually took on Martha's Vineyard, which is um, very acidic. And so all, almost all the hydrangeas that can be pink or blue are, are blue uh, in, with those soil types. And then close up of Miyama Ye Murasaki. Same, all, all blue. And then Ye no Amacha has these kind of frothy blue flowers in the center and then a kind of a semi-double flower as well. Not as double as uh, Miyama Ye Murasaki, but still uh, multiple bracts. And, and very um, uh, diminutive in its uh, uh, habit. So the next major group is uh, this group called either the, the nomenclature is kind of confused. Sometimes you see all these listed as uh, species or varieties of Aspera, or sometimes the same species or varieties of Velosa. And essentially, what this group is is uh, uh, a hydrangea like that likes full sun. It has um, generally lace cap flowers. Uh, it has these large, broad, uh, very fuzzy leaves, has a lot of indumentum and, and um, fuzz on the leaves. So it actually is, a, as far as like hydrangeas being deer resistant, there, are, there aren't any. Uh, there are some that the deer tend to like less than others, and it tends to be those that have some sort of fuzz or, or indumentum on the leaves. And I would say that this group 
if there was uh, a group that was most deer resistant, it would be this group. They also tend to shy away from, they'll eat them, but they'll shy away from the oak leaf hydrangeas, hydrangea quercifolia also because of the fuzzy leaves. But at the end of the day, they'll, if, if they're hungry enough, they will eat all, all of them. So there's a whole bunch of these aspera types. Uh, and you can see kind of the habit here. They tend to be more upright than broad spreading. Some species, there's one that I don't have a picture of called Sargentiana that's very kind of gawky. And that's the one that has the most uh, hairs or kind of fuzz on the leaves and also on, on the stems. So you can see that they're generally a lace cap, although some will, will kind of get more of a rounded head uh, depending on the species or, or cultivar. There has been some selections made. This is actually a Dan Hinckley selection that he made for uh, Monrovia. So this was a, a purple sport of Aspera, one called Plum Passion. And I have seen a, a couple other cultivars that have purple foliage, but uh, you know, this is one worth uh, looking for because it holds that nice purple foliage all summer long. And then the Velosa group tends to be more upright than it is broad spreading, fairly fuzzy leaves, a lace cap that typically has kind of these frothy fertile blue flowers in the center, and then either a pink or a white, uh, more or ornamental floret around the edge. Close up of Velosa. So these flowers are perfectly flat topped like some hydrangeas, I would say they're, they're a bit more domed. And they vary, you know, because they're, they're um, a lot of that, some are seed grown, so they can vary in their stature and also in their flower color. Here's a cultivar that's more lilac with regards to the center flowers called Sam McDonald. They tend to do, you see a lot of these Velosa and Aspera types in gardens in England, and I think they, I think they struggle with the, our, the heat of our summers. Like I've seen really nice plants in England. I've seen really nice plants in the Pacific Northwest. And while you can grow them here and they can actually get fairly large stature, I don't believe it's really the, the best uh, climate for them. Close-up of Sam McDonald. And then there's kind of a, a, a little uh, version of all of these called a hydrangea involucrata. And there are a couple selections of this. Uh, I like the buds because they look, kind of look like a rosebud. And then they have something kind of between a, a, a dome shaped flower and a, or a, a lace cap flower. And um, the ones I've grown only get about three feet tall. They're really a, a fairly small shrub. This is a double flowered one called uh, Hortensis. So if I, if I had to only pick a species of hydrangea, I think uh, at the end of the day, I would pick the, the panicle hydrangeas, hydrangea paniculata. Uh, it has a, a wide range in Japan, China, and Taiwan. They're perfectly hardy in, um, you know, most states of the U.S., perfectly hardy in Chicago, uh, you know, even places like Minnesota, while they might die to the ground, they come back. And one of the great attributes of this species is it blooms on new wood, which means, say, if you cut it to the ground or cut it back really hard, all those new stems that would come up, it would flower on those in the same growing season. So out front, I have a limelight that uh, I cut back to kind of a trunk that's maybe uh, five feet tall, and then it sends out, say, four feet of growth and then flowers heavily on that new growth every year. So it can be grown as a standard. It can be grown as a shrub that you cut back to the ground, or you can just leave it 
you know, actually many of them will grow into uh, either a very large shrub or a small tree. I'll show you a, what's called a PG hydrangea in a little bit that I drive by often. And it's probably at least 20 feet tall. It's kind of the, at least around here, kind of the classic or quintessential uh, shrub that you see in cemeteries. Uh, tough as nails, full sun, 100% uh, urban tolerant. And this is a, a species that's gone through an incredible uh, renaissance, you know, whereby, say, 20 years ago, there was a handful of cultivars. And today, if you were to grow all the hydrangea paniculata cultivars, there's probably 100. And Richard Hawkey, who manages uh, plant evaluations at the Chicago Botanic Garden, he did a, a full hydrangea paniculata trial. So if you go to a Chicago Botanic Garden website, I think it's under maybe horticulture. And, that, and if you can find the tab for plant evaluations, he has PDFs of all his past trials. And then he often writes a, a popular article on those trials for a Fine Gardening Magazine as well. So if you're interested in paniculatas in particular, I would refer you uh, to his work in Chicago because I guarantee you whatever's hardy in Chicago is going to be uh, hardy for, for us. So there's some great uh, uh, hydrangea people out there. Uh, this is Corinne and Robert Mallet, which you probably have the biggest collection of hydrangeas in the world. It's called Shamrock Gardens in uh, France. That's uh, Robert Mallet. And there's his, his uh, or their collection. Uh, the Mallets have also written uh, a book on hydrangeas. Another great book, uh, if I can find it, I, I'm sitting in my library, but I don't want to get too distracted, is there's a, there's a Mike Durr book on hyd hydrangeas, and uh, uh, that's a really good one. I would say if, if I'm going to pick a reference, I would probably uh, use his book on hydrangeas. And then another great collection, international collection, is uh, Arboretum Westphalar in, in Belgium, which is the the garden and nursery of uh, uh, Philippe, uh, or the garden and arboretum, I should say, of Philippe de Spolberg. And he has a very large hydrangea paniculata collection. You can see it here. So there's, uh, to start with some older cultivars. So, you know, again, 20 years ago, we didn't have the, the choices we have today, but there were still some good ones out there. So Tardiva, as the name would imply, tardiva means tardy. So this is a later flowering one. So paniculatus tend to flower kind of uh, midsummer, but the farther you go south, the earlier they flower. Uh, but it is a, a classic midsummer flowering uh, plant. Another one, a uh, unique. Uh, so you, you may have heard of uh, the de Belders. They're also Belgian. They were the ones who selected a lot of the hamamelis that, you know, really got people excited about hamamelis like Diane and Yelena and Antoine Court and many, many others. Well, they also did hydrangea paniculata selection and breeding. So unique is one of theirs. And then uh, this is, again, pr so precox means, uh, Precocious, so precocious is early. So if you want one that's early, I would do uh, Precox. If you want one that's um, later, I would do Tardiva. And then this is, um, so you've probably all heard the PG hydrangea. And it's often when you see it written, it's written P-E-E-G-E-E. -E -E. But what it is actually is the P is actually P period for paniculata and the G is G period for grandiflora. And what it is is hydrangea paniculata grandiflora. Very old cultivar, still, I think, one of the best. So this is one that, this is one I drive by often. It's one plant, multi-stem, probably 25 feet tall, 25 feet wide, 
And I've been watching it bloom every year for the last 35 years. And it, it looks this good every summer. It never, you know, it's not one of those plants that skips a beat for some reason. Um, you know, and I think ounce for ounce, the hydrangea paniculatas are truly one of the greatest uh, flowering shrubs out there. Some uh, other earlier cultivars that have been superseded by other, I think, better cultivars, Green Spire. And then I, uh, you know, if, I guess if I had to pick one flowering paniculator, it would be Limelight. So Limelight has this dense cone of flowers that starts out of lime green, turns to pure white, and then fades back to lime green, and then ultimately goes kind of a, a pinkish color and then turns tawny. And I actually leave the kind of tawny dry heads uh, for winter effect. This is, this is a mass in, in, in a nursery. And uh, I, this, is, this is one I have out front here. So, you know, pretty, pretty amazing with regards to the density of flowers. Here's one being grown more as a, a, a small uh, tree. Close up of the flowers. So this is, they start this color, turn to white and then fade back to this color. And then there's been even uh, greater advances like silver dollar is a little bit more compact. Uh, those flowers will actually fade to pink. So if you like, if you like say um, limelight, I actually want a head that's even bigger and maybe a little bit more stout compact plant, you might consider silver dollar. And then phantom is even supposedly larger uh, than silver dollar, eventually turns kind of a pinkish color. And then um, one that's really uh, kind of hit, hit uh, you know, hit, hit the market and, uh, you know, people are really, uh, whoops, really excited about it is Pinky Winky. So Pinky Winky, I think was first released actually in, in Europe. It's uh, a selection that comes out uh, pink. You know, most of these paniculatus come out uh, white. Uh, it stays relatively sh short, only three to four feet tall. Uh, but there's been other pink ones that have come out since Pinky Winky. There's Pinky Winky, that's in a garden in, in Belgium. So you can see more of a, a, a short stature. Daruma is a cultivar that's been around a while. It's a Japanese cultivar uh, that was selected for two reasons. One, it's fairly diminutive in its habit and it's early. It's one of the earliest to flower and also is another pink one like uh, Pinky Winky. Both uh, Burgundy Lace and pink lace were kind of precursors to many of the other pinks. I mean, they're still good. They're just uh, probably other pinks on the market now that probably have superseded uh, both of these. And then, uh, pink, uh, sorry, pink, no, not pink lace, pink lady. So, you know, this is just really the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, paniculators go. There's so many others. And again, I would consult uh, some of these evaluations to uh, look at the ones that you know really are the high, highest ranked, um, you know. But there's probably not a dud in in the group. I think if you bought a paniculata with any attribute, I think you'd be happy with uh, the results. So the next group I'd like to talk about are what are called the smooth hydrangeas. It's uh, uh, a North American, mainly e Eastern North America with a fairly wide range. Like you can go into 
most woods in, uh, on the East Coast and even extending into the Midwest and find hydrangea arborescens. And in the wild, it tends to be kind of a lax open shrub with kind of lace, white lace cap flowers. But it was from the, you know, again, that, that, that original, some collections made um, that uh, all the cultivars that have been developed have come from those. So we'll look at Annabelle in a moment. And Annabelle's perhaps the most, one of the most famous and most used and one of the, mo one of the best uh, cultivars of a hydrangea, hydrangea probably on the planet. And that was a, a selection of a, a more of a hortensia or mop head type that was made from um, a wild collection in uh, Illinois. So this is kind of what a, a typical smooth hydrangea would look like. Uh, this is not in the wild. This is actually was in my front yard. This, this part of the garden has changed multiple times since, since then. Um, but that's kind of your typical hydrangea arborescence at, as a species. And then uh, of course, uh, if anybody's heard of any hydrangea, it's a Annabelle. And so the arborescens like paniculata bloom on new woods. So you can either leave this kind of as is and not prune it, or the Annabelles I have, I cut back to maybe 12, six to 12 inches in the spring. I tend to do in the spring versus the fall because hydrangeas tend to have um, hollow stems and sometimes water can settle in there if you cut them in the fall and then freeze and sometimes split open the stem. So I tend to cut them back, you know, in this area, maybe mid-March, you can probably in DC do it in, in middle of February, but so, sometime late, late winter. Uh, I have a, a friend at um, Chicago Botanic Garden. He used to work for uh, a thoroughbred horse farm in Kentucky. And they treated this as almost like a perennial where they would come in with like a heavy, Kind of brush hog type mower and actually mow these to the ground and they would just come back like they were a herbaceous perennial so you can prune it however you want to prune it uh, but if you do cut it back it tends to come back and get to about four feet tall and again in the summer it starts out with kind of these uh, green mop heads that fit, go to white and then back to green and then tawny kind of the same way that say hydrangea paniculata limelight performs, but more of a, a dome shape. And while paniculatas want full sun, uh, hydrangea arborescens, I would say does best in uh, dappled uh, sunlight. Uh, they can grow in deep shade, but the flowering won't, won't be as good. Good as a cut flower, just a, it just, you know, if I again had to pick my top five hydrangeas, this would, definitely be in the top five. Just, uh, and like paniculata, you, ne you, never, you never have an off season. They're always good. And like in Chicago, because of hardiness issues with other hydrangeas, this is probably by far the most popular hydrangea it, at least in, in Chicago, but probably throughout the Midwest. You know, if, you, if you're looking for a strong white flowering plant, this is really uh, unbeatable. And you can see the pruning here. So that's kind of upper left is winter interest. And then lower right is kind of what would happen or how you might prune it, uh, say late, late winter. <clears throat> so, uh, like many, many plants, uh, people are always trying to improve upon them. So, uh, one of the goals with arborescence, kind of two goals, was to make bigger flowers with sturdier stems. And then to also kind of one of the holy grails of the hydrangea world was to create a pink Annabelle. So, we'll kind of talk about that in a moment. To lower right, actually, is Hydrangea quercifolia, little honey, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then to the upper right is one of the aspera types. 
This is at uh, the Scott Arboretum, which actually has one of the best uh, hydrangea collections around. So you can see that's a, a man's hand. <clears throat> you know, fairly large, you know, even larger than Annabelle flowers. That's one called Incredible. And then Incredible again. And again. Now, if you like uh, Annabelle, but you maybe again have a small property or just want a smaller version. There is one called a uh, limetta, which is essentially just a, you know, a two to three foot version of Annabelle versus say a four to five foot version. Another great breakthrough with, a, with uh, hydrangea arborescence is this massive, both in stature and in flower lace cap version of uh, arborescence called Haas Halo. And for whatever reason, this has great vigor from a plant, like those are cut to the ground every year also, but they get almost five to six feet tall. And then it's just massive lace cap. And, uh, you know, the hydrangeas, especially these arborescence types are also great uh, pollinator plants. There's Haas Halo in the, in the winter. Of course, like everything, if you want a double flowered one, there's one called Haze's Starburst. The problem for me with Haze's Starburst is the flowers are so laden with petals that they become head heavy and kind of almost can lay down in the garden. So I think if you're gonna grow this, you may actually wanna stake it or maybe actually grow it up through like a peony hoop or something like that to kind of keep the flowers elevated off the ground. So I mentioned that the quest for uh, essentially a pink uh, Annabelle. And so um, the idea was that if they could find even a, an arborescence in the wild was a slight amount of pink that through multiple generations of breeding, they could do this. So Tom Rainey, who's in Western North Carolina, part of North Carolina State University, he and his grad students did that. They, they just combed the woods of North Carolina, found an arborescence with a little bit of pink, and then through multiple generations of breeding created invincible spirit. So that was the first pink. And then they actually have a whole uh, pink series now. So that's invincible spirit again. And then there's one invincible spirit too, which you can see here. It's a whole range of pinks from like light pink, deeper pink to almost uh, burgundy. And then this one, which is Ruby Mountain. So all these are in, in that series. And then there's some other uh, varieties of arborescence. Radiata has a nice kind of silver underside to the leaf. There's another one called Discolor that has kind of a similar underside to the leaf. You can see here, here we have uh, uh, you know, the different subspecies, uh, this uh, Discolor in the middle, and then our regular arborescence all the way to the far right. Problem is you have to lay on your, your back and look up to really appreciate the silver. Like uh, maybe the next holy grail of the hydrangea world should be to hybridize a hydrangea that has that silver underside of the leaf on the top of the leaf. That would be a major breakthrough. And then Samantha is actually a selection that was made for, uh, because of the underside, but again, you know, unless you're flipping leaves over, laying on, on your back, looking skywards, you're not going to really see it. Another great group, another favorite group, which is also native. You find these more in the southeastern parts of the U.S., northern Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, are the oak leaf hydrangeas. And they're called the oak leaf because they have a, a leaf that's like a red oak leaf. And they actually turn kind of a... a a shade that you might see on an oak in the fall, which is kind of a reddish 
burgundy. They tend to have upright, uh, skyward facing panicles of white flowers, but there are ones that are kind of pinkish and there's ones that fade pink and there's little ones and there's double ones and, and so on. There's not as many selections as say uh, the panicle hydra hydrangeas, but still, you know, if you were to collect them all, there's probably, it's gotta be 50 cultivars, I would guess. Uh, so we'll go through some of those. So here's kind of typical oak leaf, just a great, if you're looking for a great native shrub. Uh, they can, again, take shade, the flower best in full sun. Great fall color. You know, most hydrangeas just turn kind of a yellowish brown in the fall, but this actually has exceptional fall color. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one called Alice which is a good floriferous type. Sims Beauty has some of the longest flower heads of all the oak leaves. And then my favorite, and this is one that's been around for decades, is one called Snow, Snow Queen. Uh, just, again, they're summer flowering year in and year out. Uh, good flowering, the flowers you can see on the left fade pink. In the background of the one on the left is a sour uh, wood, uh, Oxydendrum arboreum. Combined nicely with other shrubs, you can see a, a white variegated dogwood here. These are all at um, Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College. Just a, you know, it's one, one that's a, uh, around, you know, probably one of the more popular cultivars. And then there's a double. So this is a really interesting plant. It has, like, like that haze starburst of the arborescence, it has these double flowers, but they're actually, the stems are stronger, so they actually hold them up, but it has this incredible pendant aspect. And I've seen this grown on top of walls, and that's really a nice way to display this plant. And then these double flowers will turn a soft pink as well. Amethyst is one that actually comes out uh, a pinkish color. So that, you know, that's, uh, that's a breakthrough for quercifolia is to have that color of flower. Uh, Ellen Huff has very large flowers. It almost looks double, but it's it's because the flowers are are so uh, large. And then Harmony actually is another another kind of double flower type, but arranged differently than. Uh, snowflake and that it has these big uh, multi petaled flowers, but it just makes for a denser flower cl cl cluster. So um, I'm not sure I like this. I think it looks kind of gawky to me in the landscape. Uh, Ruby slippers is part of uh, breeding that happened in the US National Arboretum. So this is a, a smaller stature hydrangea that has flowers come out white, but turn this incredible uh, deep pink. So this is, this is one of my favorites also. I think it's great for the smaller landscape. Uh, Sykes Dwarf is another uh, diminutive one. And then Peewee, so Sykes Dwarf, Peewee, and ruby slippers are all on the on the smaller side. And then as is little honey, little honey is also small, small kind of cones and white flowers, and then uh, these pure kind of sulfur yellow leaves. The trick with peewee is if you give it too much sun, it burns. If you give it too much shade, it turns green. So it really likes to be kind of on the edge of the woodland or under dappled shade. And then we'll just end with some of the relatives. So there, there's the climbing hydrangea, which actually 
is self-clinging that has little rootlets along the stem. So it can be grown up on the trunk of a tree, on a fence, on the side of your house. It has flowers that are kind of fertile flowers in the center and then a tier of white flowers along the edge. It has really good yellow fall color and really sweet fragrance in the middle of July, at least in this area. And then there's a cultivar, a couple of cultivars, one called Miranda and one called Firefly, which has uh, Firefly is a selection by Dan Benarsik, who's a gardener at Chant Chanticleer. He made this selection as house in Delaware. So it's <coughs> green in the center and chartreuse on the edge. And then a close relative is what's called the Japanese hydrangea vine. Same characteristics, self-clinging, uh, but this you'll see the flowers are really incredible. This is uh, Schizophragma hydrangeoides. And then what it has is sterile flowers, I mean, fertile flowers in the center, and then the sterile bracts almost look like they're hovering above the foliage. A great cultivar called Moonlight, which has a... Uh, and this pewter sheen over the leaves and then the green veins stand out. Uh, that does really well, like it flowers best in sun, but the variegation is best in shade. And then this one is Schizophragma hydrangeoides quell partensis, which has fantastic flowers. Again, self-clinging on, on that wall. And then if you're looking kind of from the native version of both of these, there's one called Decumaria barbara, which again is, grows mainly all through uh, uh, the Southeast and up into uh, uh, Arkansas, and I think even into Southern Illinois. Uh, it has fantastic butter yellow fall color. Uh, the flowers are all uh, fertile and no showy bracts, uh, fragrant also in the summer, self-clinging. And, and native as well. And then just a couple of herbaceous relatives. This is a, a Deonanthe cerulea, which gets about three feet tall and three feet wide, does well in part sun to shade. Has this nice kind of, um, kind of uh, two-parted leaf that adds kind of a textural component. And comes in, this one is uh, kind of lavender and then bifida is white. and has that, that same type of leaf. So I'll finish with bifida and just a couple slides. Here's one just to tell you a little bit about um, the flower show. So first time it's been outdoors in almost 200 years, June 5th to the 13th. Uh, if you go to phsonline.org and go to the flower show page, uh, you can buy timed uh, tickets because we will still have a social distancing plan. And then there's my, you can see my email and then the phsonline.org. And I'll finish with that and say thank you very much. And if we have time, uh, I think we have seven minutes. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We do have some questions, Andrew, but thank you. Sure. You reminded me how much I really do love hydrangeas. What's apparent <laughs> from your presentation, there is a hydrangea that will grow in almost any situation with so many different forms and actually so many different colors because of the foliage color that they're outstanding. And I have a climbing hydrangea on the side of my house that is 40 feet tall. It has almost reached the top of my chimney and it is gloriously in bloom right now. And in the fall, it will be that beautiful butter yellow like you're explaining. So thank you for reminding us of how terrific they are. Sure. Uh, you did say that hydrangeas, the question is how far south can they grow? Um, you said Mississippi. Can they grow into Florida yeah. as well? Yes. Yeah. So um, the ones that are the by far the most heat tolerant are the paniculatas. So I think the paniculatas could easily go into central Florida. I think what the issue down, say, in Miami, that, and, and I don't I'm just speculating is humidity. 
mm -hmm. uh, might might get to them, uh, but maybe there's somebody that could answer that. Um, so yeah, you could grow hydrangeas all through the southeastern U.S., Texas. They're not going to do well in like real droughty areas like say Arizona, but most of, you know probably most parts of California since it's those gardens are irrigated. Uh, most of these hydrangeas would do fine. Okay. Well, why don't you stop screen sharing so they can see the audience can see you a little bit better. And no, uh, no. yeah, that's all right. I, I do the same thing. I always forget that I'm yeah. doing two th things at once. Um, so that's great. So they can go. We lived in Key West for a while and I don't remember seeing any hydrangeas. Yeah, down there I don't, I think so. my, my, my hunch is like real so South Florida that mm -hmm. they, he's probably not conducive to, to to growing these and they wouldn't they it would be they wouldn't get the proper kind of winter hardening either right that that's probably more than anything else uh because we could water them but how about if you are going up further north uh new england i know they're they're growing in Chicago. oh yeah so new, new england uh i would say all of hydrangea serrata arborescens and almost all the paniculatas would be fine Excellent. You know, leaves, you know, they become an it. Like we had some oak leaves at, at Chicago Botanic Garden, but they struggled. And I suspect as you go farther north, not that you couldn't grow them, but they're not going to, going to thrive. And so okay. the velosas, the velosas tend to be more a zone six, seven plant. So yeah, serrata, paniculata, ar arborescens, uh, climbing hydrangea, schizophragma should be fine, uh, like up through uh, New England. Excellent. Okay, this is one that I remember learning a hundred years ago in, in horticulture uh, classes to change the color. There's so many different wives tales. Yeah. And pH, of course, is the secret to the ones that will change. Not all of them will change, as you said. Can I've heard everything from coffee grounds to pennies to nails. What is the best way to get a, a, a hydrangea to change color? Yeah, pro probably getting some sort of, synth, uh, you know, uh, like ho holly tone or so, something that has, uh, you know, some, you know, some ke chemical mix in it. Uh, I mean, you can add, you know, uh, I'm not an advocate of adding peat moss because I think how peat moss is harvested is not sustainable. Um, so, you know, it, it may be some sort of sulfur based, um, you know, kind of blend, uh, you know, powder or, or uh, liquid, you know, that'd probably be the best way to, quickest way to kind of, kind of flip the switch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I, I would highly recommend that you get your soil tested first, your pH yeah. tested first, so you know really what's going on with your soil. And then uh, there are additives, like you said, the I think something like Hollytone would be the safest because when you yeah. start messing with magnesium sulfite and <laughs> aluminum sulfite, you could do a lot of damage very quickly. Right, right. So I would, I, and I'm sure you would echo this, buy the color you want first. Don't try right. to change it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah. Eric uh, um, is one of our horticulturists that works and he could tell you lots of stories about hydrangeas being the wrong colors and what we've had. To yeah, do. like I bought one time one called Forever Pink. And it was forever pink for the first year and then was forever blue thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one a lot. Um, the, the big heads tend to flop. You did mention staking them. Anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big proponent of stake. I mean, it'd be hard to stake a shrub. You know, the only one I would mm -hmm. be staking is that one called Hay Starburst. I would say all the others. You know, sometimes Annabelle, like after, say, a thunderstorm when things are really wet and things have been kind of blown around, they can they can tend to splay open. That one incredible, supposed to be ha have stronger stems. That was one of the, the things they selected about that. Um, but I would say in, ge in general, most of these hydrangeas are going to stand up. Mm -hmm. And you could get creative. I've seen Wave Hill do neat tutors that yeah, you know, they sure. grow up through. and Yeah, or have other mistaken. shrubs around it that kind of support it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But 
Thank you. So much good information. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you, our audience, for joining us again today for another fabulous presentation, this time on hydrangeas with Andrew Bunting. And we'll have more next week. We have another fa fabulous uh, presentation. And just keep joining us and we'll take a break in August. But until then, you're going to see great presentations every week. Thank you, Andrew. Good Andrew. luck with the flower show. Yeah, good good luck. I hope to see all the viewers up at, in Philadelphia in a few weeks. And thank you for having me again. Well, thank you. Best to all everyone right, in that area. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye.